at a meeting uh, in Pittsburgh uh, a couple of uh, uh, a few months ago, three months ago, four months ago, um, and uh, and we got to talking about uh, about GCMs, and and uh, he said he was working on on uh, the value of uh, of having bad models uh, or maybe imperfect models uh, in in your multi model ensemble, and I thought the people at GIS would like to hear about this. <laughs> Um, uh, for for many years, as you're almost certainly aware, um, it, you know the GIST model was the bad model in the multi-model ensemble for a number of uh, diagnostics, and, uh, and we found ourselves giving uh, justifications of that to our program managers uh, on a pretty regular basis. Uh, unfortunately, that doesn't happen quite so much anymore. Um, <laughs> but uh, but philosophically, oh, we are we are very much. Uh, the concept of uh, bad models having value. Um, uh, Ryan uh, is a, a new New Yorker um, and has been here since uh, since the fall, working at Queens College, um, and uh, and and is now teaching philosophy. and uh, I thought it'd be great for him to come along and uh, and tell us about uh, about what what he's doing. So okay, well, thank, thank you. you. Is it? Where if I stand, if it's easier for me to stay yeah, where you want. Okay. Okay. Stay on the floor if you want to. Uh, I don't think my voice will project that well. <laughs> so, so thanks for the introduction and thanks for having me. Um, I'm excited to give sort of a philosophy talk to a scientific audience. Um, so, why we should want models to disagree the value of bad models in climate science. Um, before, is this going to work? Nope. <laughs> there we go. So before getting into it, uh, a prologue or maybe a bit of a disclaimer. So I am a philosopher of science. That's how I was trained. I do spend a lot of time reading scientific literature. I'm really, really interested in science. Um, but I think I owe it to you to say at least a little bit about why you might be interested in hearing what a philosopher has to say. So, I mean, one point is that in really general terms, philosophers and scientists, I think, have a shared goal, um, knowledge generation. Scientists run experiments, run model, numerical models, look at the results, hopefully gain the knowledge. Philosophers don't do experiments, but we're often interested in the justification of knowledge. Why why is the knowledge that you found in your experiment worth believing? Maybe this overlaps also with characterizing uncertainty, not necessarily in numerical terms like scientists do, but philosophers do care about, care about characterizing uncertainty. And there are methodological similarities, which might surprise you. Um, both philosophers of science and scientists look at empirical evidence. For me, the empirical evidence is uh, what scientists tell me or what I see in the scientific literature. Um, for scientists, of course, the results of experiments and observations and that sort of thing. Um, and of course, there are methodological differences, uh, not just in terms of the specific empirical evidence that we look at, uh, but specialized terminology or, or jargon. So if I use any philosophy jargon, or if you have a question about a term, um, feel free to interrupt and ask. And if I use a scientific term totally incorrectly, <laughs> feel free to interrupt and correct me. <laughs> okay, so I want to start with like a key takeaway point, sort of hinted at in the, in the title of the talk, but make it a little bit more concrete. So one thing I want you to take away is that I think bad models provide scientific insights and serve an evidential role beyond just the, the phrase of like exploring structural uncertainty. And and these are four different ways in which that happens. I will have examples for each of those, so I'm not going to read or talk about them. Okay, so an overview of, of what's going to be included in the talk. I'm going to set the stage, specify which models I'm talking about, although you might already have guessed. And then in the previous slide, I told you I told you that bad models have value, but what exactly is a bad model? I think we should specify that, and it's in quotes because I'm being intentionally provocative. I don't think that uh, climate models or any climate model that any modeling institution is working on is really bad, but it gets your attention, right? And then, and then I want to talk about performance and weighting models by skill. I think this is a really obvious case where we can talk about good versus bad models, low skill versus higher skill models for a metric of choice. And I have some examples to explore that in relation to the idea of, of bad models having value. 
And then I will talk about a scientific controversy in which bad models played an evidential role. And then I'm going to say something about the process of figuring out why a bad model is bad, diagnosing errors, a couple of conclusions. Okay, so as a philosopher of science, I find general circulation models or earth system models, the, the big models with all the bells and whistles, I find them fascinating because they're the product of all of these different expertises over time, pooling the knowledge together, putting it into a bunch of computer code that nobody fully understands in its entirety, um, guessing. <laughs> and, then, and, then you get, and then you get the results and, and generate new knowledge and sometimes um, exciting new knowledge. And so, so that's where I'm coming from, but at the same time, I think it's helpful to remind um, folks that like when we're talking about bad models versus good models, this is a multi-model context where all the models in question usually have the same target system. Usually it's the Earth, right? And these models are part of like a, I like to think of it like a GCM model family in a sense, like same core physics, a lot of, a lot of shared ideas, so the models are very inter, interdependent. And yet we have these interesting differences, um, different renderings with the same core, different ways to parameterize processes happening at a smaller scale than, than a grid scale. And just differences in resolutions between models and other things like differences in software architecture. So different GCMs from different places have different ways of like articulating the model, but they share quite a bit in common too. And then thinking also just in terms of motivation, uh, GCMs to me are sort of fascinating. The way they've been intercompared over time is also really interesting to me. So CMIP has like the CMIP is goes back to like the year two thousand, well, and then the A MIP in the nineties, and then if you think of model intercomparison in broader terms, we have examples of models being intercompared in like the seventies, um, and and so this and just to put some numbers to it, I guess so A MIP in the nineties was. 30-ish modeling groups. Today, CMIP 6, 49 modeling groups, 100 distinct models, which distinct, not exactly sure what that means. <laughs> um, but so, so models themselves are interesting, all of this interdisciplinary expertise going into building the model, like I said before. But now we have this case where all of these different models, all of these different ex expertises at different institutions are building their own models in ways that uh, may differ from institution to institution in ways that aren't properly documented or captured, so that maybe folks here don't exactly know what everybody's doing over at, at NCOM, for example. Um, and so it's this huge sort of social element to, to scientific knowledge generation that's going on. And so that's sort of where I'm coming from and thinking about like the fruitfulness of this whole research project sort of spelled out nicely with this is a diagram from, from the CMIP-6 uh, the deck experiments and then the individual, like the optional MIPS, I guess. And these things are focused on things like diagnosing common biases across models or gaining additional knowledge about things like, um, like, like cloud feedbacks and that sort of thing. And so this, this continuity of a research strategy to learn more through integrating these different um, model results and these modeling efforts together is really uh, philosophically fascinating to me. Okay, so that's sort of the background, um, how I think about these issues and, and where I'm coming from. But now turning to specifically to the, the real topic of the talk, what is a bad model? I like to start with this quote. A lot of people love to use this quote. It's, it's a good quote. It's a good quote, <laughs> it's a good quote and it's catchy. All models are wrong and then usually the, the second part, but some are useful. But I think it's worth pausing when we see this, because there are different ways to interpret this idea of wrong, right? One interpretation is that models inevitably idealize and abstract. So things like parameterizations is a good example of an abstraction. We, we don't worry about the details happening at the finer scale and instead just worry about well, what is the effect of, of those processes at the grid scale of the model. Or things like 
maybe more mundane differences, any difference between a model and the real world, the fact that uh, on a supercomputer, when the model simulates it, it has time steps, um, whereas in the real world, it doesn't have time steps. And philosophers have talked about whether idealization and abstraction are problematic for generating knowledge for, for a long time, philosophers going back to the 60s, 70s, and 80s. So just a little bit of, of what they've said. Um, and this, they're keying into the idea that models abstract and idealize by necessity, otherwise they wouldn't be models. It's just what it is to be a model. So uh, Ryan Geary is a philosopher of science. He says that all models are incomplete, always the case. Nancy Cartwright, she's writing about physics laws, but I think also applies to models. There's always a trade-off in science between the literal truth or the literal truth and full precision on the one hand versus the explanatory power of the model on the other hand. And uh, something that, that I said in a recent paper, the very practice of scientific modeling requires that the model be unrealistic in at least some ways. Uh, a fully realistic model that's completely like the system in every single way um, is, would be just as difficult to analyze as the system itself. It's the divulgence story. Uh, yes. I think, I thought I got that idea from Geary, but I think Geary... Yeah, it goes, it goes back a long time. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So that's, and that's one interpretation of all models are wrong, but there's another interpretation which says that well, all models produce output that is inaccurate, or at least all models produce at least some output, make some predictions that is at least somewhat inaccurate. Uh, I don't know if anyone actually ever means this when they say this, but it's sort of like a food for thought as a way to sort of explore this idea a little bit further. Uh, this is another way one could interpret the idea of all models being wrong. Okay, so then I want to introduce a definition, what I'm going to think, how we're going to think about bad models for the, for the talk. So all models produce at least some output that is bad or inaccurate. That's the interpretation, the second interpretation that I just gave you of all models are wrong. But models do not all produce equally bad output. A model is bad if it performs worse than or produces worse output than less accurate output than other models for a given task or application. So throughout when I'm referring to a bad model, it's always with a given modeling purpose in mind. I'm not trying to make sure like a statement about a model being used for every single conceivable task. All right. And I'm not sure if I mentioned this, but feel free to interrupt if, if I say something that doesn't make sense. So the idea of some models being worse than others based on their output immediately makes me think of performance and weighting by skill, and there's a big literature on this climate science. And, and so here we have a, a portrait diagram back from Kleckler et al. in 2008, and it's supposed to be comparing the relative skill of, of different models. And as you can see, ignoring, so we have the models on the x-axis, right, and then the different variables on the y-axis, and ignoring the, the mean model and the multi, and the mean median model columns. And red basically means higher error, and blue means uh, lower error. And you can see that it's, I think it's for two different, for the northern and the southern hemisphere, that's why the each square has a, a diagonal. And you can see that it's, it's a really, like it's a mixed bag, right? The models are all over the place. There's no clear winner if we wanted to rank them for all of the, of the variables. Again, setting aside the, the mean and median models, which is, Interesting, I think. But even if we wanted to just focus on two models, we still would have a similar conundrum. So which model is better, the, the blue arrow model or the green arrow model? Uh, maybe we're really interested in how well the model could be useful for doing temperature, in which case the blue arrow model would be, would be better. In that case, the green arrow model would be the bad one. Or maybe we're interested in uh, geopotential height, and then the green, the green arrow model would be better in that case. So depending on your the metric of choice, um, some models are going to come out on top versus others, and then you change your metric and you get a different, different ranking of the models. Right? 
And so in this context, um, there have been a lot of proposals. So this is back in 2008. And I think from then and even until fairly recently, the, the idea of model democracy, one model, one vote, let's not weight the models, was the norm. Well, but in, in the last... But that's a function of like how well the mean model performed in assessments like this. So what's the explanation though for that? That's exactly, but that's a very, that's an unknown thing. Like no, I have, I have, I have never seen a convincing argument for why the mean model is better than all the models. Mm. So the at one answer I've seen given not with great confidence was like compensating biases between different models. Oh, sure, but I mean that's just that's just a statement of that result in words, right? The biases obviously compensate, but why? Uh, but this is not, there's no central limit theorem here, right? It doesn't, it doesn't, the error doesn't go to zero the more models you put in, it saturates, right? It doesn't look like any sampling problem that you've ever looked at before, mm -hmm. right? So, so you can't, you can't refer to, you know, just Gaussian noise, right? Mm -hmm. That's not what's happening. You've got Gaussian noise plus systematic errors that don't go away. Mm -hmm. But it's still better than that. Why is it, why is it, why is it better than every single individual model? Right? It's not like the average model isn't even physically coherent, right? You know, uh, what does it even mean? And yet, so so model democracy, like nobody wanted model democracy, right? Uh, I people people thought, at least through CMIP three, that we were striving to make the one perfect model, right? And that. Uh, and that that was what we should be doing, and that we just find the one best model, and then we would use that. But then, as you see, like you can't find one best model, and then the model democracy thing came in because well, um, well, if you average all the models, then it's better than all the models. So that's um, so that's the, the story forward. But now there is more push. So, right. wait so, so now, 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 now it's different. But, but then. Well, had they had they put in some more complicated diagnostics like strata cumulus cloud fraction specifically or cumulus cloud fraction on the uh, y-axis, no. maybe would have seen. Oh uh, no, 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 no! Because risk. this is relative performance, right? So this is a very odd graph, which I thought was oh, odd even even at, the, uh, even at the time. It is not any absolute statement of accuracy okay. of the model. It is how the models rank with respect to the other models. Right? So so that's why the, the, the you know, all of them are doing temperature much better than they're doing precipitation, but, but that all gets washed out because it, there's, there's no absolute measure of skill here. It's all, that's all being normalized out. Right? So if you put in something tricky that they're not going to do very well, you would see exactly the same oh. thing, even though the absolute error will yeah, be yeah, yeah. in the case. <laughs> it's, good. it's good to think about, and I think, I mean, it's sort of future project, I think, still getting an explanation for this if somebody, I don't know, people are thinking about. Oh. Well, see, <laughs> through CMIT 5, right, people were thinking about that a lot, but then, then the CMIT 6 models came in and people stopped thinking about it. <laughs> well, and you can never run a mean model. Right. <laughs> so right. What's but does the results still hold the CMIT 6? Was the... No. Okay, because of the... Sensitivity issues. Uh, so it probably still holds in the climatological uh, skill measures, but it does not hold uh, for which is the which people assume. I mean, given this result for the climatology, people will then effectively use the average of all the models. As a as the appropriate best predictor, right? I still, I mean, I produce pictures that do that all the time, um, uh, and that worked. And so, if you look at the CMIT three models, you made the average of all of those models. It is a perfect, literally a perfect match to the uh, to the long term trends that we've seen subsequent to the CMIT three models. Um, and so, you know, empirically, therefore, you're just kind of assuming, well. You know the histogram of the model was might we'll just treat it as if it's a PDF, even though we know it's not a, we know it has no probabilistic um, status. Uh, but you, but that that 
that does not work for a single site. So that's the new thing. Okay. So then looking ahead, I guess, to... Well, so more recently, there have been, I hope I'm right in saying, increasing calls to weight the models by performance. Well, performance and independence, but I'm really just talking about performance um, for the talk, just because it's easier to make sense of, of bad models like that. But there have been increasing calls to weight the models. Um, if it's clear for a given uh, task that, that some models are just going to be bad candidates, or they're going to perform worse um, by some measures. And so, like, like the question might be, why not just exclude the bad models or don't weight them, assuming that you wouldn't have too small of an uh, ensemble as a result of that. And so, I mean, there could be all sorts of answers to that, but one answer I want, I want to think about here is that, yes, we can do this. Sometimes there's, there are examples in the literature of this, this happening. Um, but at the same time, this doesn't mean that the bad models aren't helpful, even when we decide to downweight them. So that's what I want to think about in relation to skill, uh, weighting by skill and performance. So bad models can help constrain estimates of climate variables. Bad models can be used to test weighting schemes. And just to repeat, bad is a provocative term here. I don't actually mean that the models are bad. They're just performing, <laughs> performing worse than others. Uh, and maybe some of them actually are bad, but I'll stay away from that. <laughs> Okay, so I'm really intrigued by this, and I hope I explain it correctly. This idea of the perfect model or model as truth experiment. So I think the idea is that if you have like a weighting scheme, like an equation that's going to be used to weight an ensemble of models, and you use it based on well independence, model independence on the one hand, but also fit between your ensemble and observations, you want to know if that same weighting scheme would be successful for variables of interest. Um, outside of the context of what you just observed. So maybe in a future climate with higher than observed um, CO2 levels. And we don't have observations to test that weighting scheme against. So maybe you could do like a paleoclimate study, but then there are maybe issues with like temporal and spatial mm -hmm. sparsity of data. So then you use models to generate the data that can then be used to test the weighting scheme. That's That's the idea. And so let's, let's walk through what that looks like, and then I'll say something about bad models in relation to that. So the idea is we have an ensemble of models depicted here as marbles. You take one and you call it the ground truth. It's the perfect model, the true model. And then you use your weighting scheme um, and apply it to the rest of the ensemble, all the other models that are not the ground truth. So they're weighted based on how well they fit the ground truth. Maybe, for, maybe it's some time period X that overlaps with, say, the observational record. And then um, you, you compute the unweighted mean for a later time period Y. So the models maybe simulate up to, say, the 20s, or something like that. And you compare the unweighted mean for that later time period to the weighted mean. And then if you see that, that when you compare them, which one does a better job? compared to the ground truth over that later time period y. And then if you see that there's a good, better fit, that, that the weighted mean does better, then this gives you a little bit of confidence that the, the weighting scheme um, can generalize a little bit out of sample, that it's not just picking up on some maybe idiosyncrasies of, of the observational data. And then you don't just do this with one model, you do this with every model in the ensemble. Each one takes a turn playing the role of ground truth. And so, that's, that's how I understand these perfect model studies. I think there are a couple other tests that you would run in addition to that. But one, one thing that I think is interesting is that all of the models in the ensemble play the role of ground truth. You test the weighting scheme against each one. So there seems to be an implicit assumption that all of the models are going to give you a, a sufficiently realistic climate that would be worth testing the weighting scheme on. Um, and yet, Right, we can imagine once we actually apply this weighting scheme back to the, how the models fit the observational data, some are going to be worse than others. Some may be downweighted. And so even the ones, that, here I'm just pointing out that even the ones that are downweighted later on still got to play the role of ground truth to help you. It still helps generate um, data to test the weighting scheme. on. So the bad models get to help in, in testing the weighting scheme, basically. 
and also in, in the context of evaluating models by performance, there's this this example um, from a paper from Pinto Parsca et al. in 2020. And so this is an example of emergent an emergent constraints approach. Uh, think of it as a historical constraints approach. So the models, each dot here is a model, and they're plotted based on uh, recent temperature trends versus TCR, transient climate response, how much uh, temperature would change as CO2 gradually doubles. And so the, the idea with the approach is that you want a var two variables. One is a variable which you can uh, compare models to based on how well they do for that. So you can compare the models to the actual observational record. And then another one, TCR, the variable of interest, something that you want to estimate. And when you have the, the variables in question, when they have a strong, tight theoretical relationship, then you would expect there to be a correlation. Of course, recent warming should correlate with TCR because the recent observational record is a period over which CO2 is increasing. So we have a strong reason for thinking that these things will be correlated. The models indicate that. There's a really strong correlation here. And then what you can do and what, what they actually do, I don't know how well you can see the blue band, but there's a blue band like here. And so the models that both fit the observational record well, both fall this one here, and which fall along the, um, the slope of the correlation are the ones that can be used to give the new estimate of TCR. So the estimate of TCR, if we used all the models, I mean, it ranges from like 1.25 up to almost three. But then once we get the constrained estimate, it's, it narrows to like two point. Yeah. So it narrows quite a bit. It's, it's a very big improvement. Um, and if you're curious, the, the number or the colors of the dots just refer to the equilibrium climate sensitivity values of the different models. And so how do bad models play a role here? Well, it seems like this correlation, this box is not precisely drawn, so please forgive me. But the correlation itself seems to be an essential ingredient in the analysis. Um, and we wouldn't have it if we got rid of the, the, the two hot models that are in the upper right hand side. Or the models in the green box. Those are bad models in the sense that they perform much worse compared to these other models when compared to recent temperature trends. And yet, they seem to play an essential role in helping constrain the estimate of TCR. And I'm not entirely sure what to say about the yellow box models. Again, not drawn very precisely. So yeah, forgive me for that. But models which seem to match the temperature, recent temperature trends well, and yet are not used in the new estimate of TCR. This seems to be telling us something. Like not all bad models are useful. Some models seem to be uh, good at something and yet bad at something that implies some sort of physical inconsistency. Maybe there's tuning or something going on. Mm -hmm. um, you know which ones we don't. Uh, yeah. And and so, so this is to reiterate the point that some bad models are, are useful, not all bad models are useful. And maybe even thinking about the, the explanation for why some of these, the yellow box models, let's call them, could be fruitful in some other ways. So maybe they have some additional future uses. But at least in the context of this study, uh, some of the models, some of the bad models that, that I think we would agree are fit the observations poorly, nonetheless helped in improving the estimate of, of TCR. Okay, the next is sort of a scientific controversy. This is way back in like the mid 2000s. Uh, Gavin pointed me to this example. Um, to the next slide. So if I do a good job, it seems compelling to you. Uh, credit to him. If I do a bad job explaining it, that's on me. Um, <laughs> Too kind. So, so, so bad models, here's my claim, they can serve as sources of evidence in resolving scientific controversy. So the controversy in question um, has to do with, I mean, there was this issue with, with satellite data and uh, 
observations of tropospheric warming not being what was expected based on based on theory, based on modeling results. And so this was used by some people to call into question anthropogenic climate change altogether. And so this study from Sandra et al. in 2015, they look at the, the ratio um, between surface warming on the one hand and lower tropospheric warming on the other hand. And they use the models in an important way to, to look at this relationship. So here's one of the figures. This is looking at monthly variability of their surface temperatures on the, on the x-axis and lower tropospheric, lower tropospheric temperatures on the, on the y-axis. And the different colors, shapes are different models, and then we have the, the satellite data products here. And so what, we'll note, what we should notice is that the models are, and there's a big model spread, right? We're talking just 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3 degrees Celsius on the models. Um, are giving us a, a huge range of values. And yet they fit this, they, they exhibit this slope um, 1.3 really nicely. That was actually in accordance with theoretical expectations. And the, the if, I, if I remember right, one of the reasons the models are giving such a diverse diversity of values is because of ENSO simulation. Um, so this is during SEMA 3, because of model resolution, some of the models had insufficient and so variability some of them had uh i guess like an overactive and so and so you get this huge range of values absolute values for monthly variability and yet they're still getting the ratio um well in a, in right or in a way that's fits just consistently <clears throat> and the scientists in the study look beyond just the monthly variability to decadal trends and the models still give the same, roughly the same slope. <laughs> it's really interesting because if you take a model from over here and you look at it over there, it's actually a lot of times there's no correlation between the two. The individual models are giving you different, different scaling ratios in the two cases. But collectively, both times, we see about the, the same slope. Is that? Yeah. Okay. And so with the scientific controversy coming back, so the satellite data seems just overlap here that's nice but then notice over here how far off some of the satellite data is and i don't know if you can see this shading here but that's implying that that's where trop lower tropospheric temperatures are actually cooling so that's where it's negative so some of the satellite data is showing i'm um, a cooling relative to surface temperature trends um, and so the idea here the idea here was to call into question or to resolve a controversy. Why are some satellite data, why is some satellite data giving you this answer? Why does theory say this? Why do the models say this? And because because the models could be shown to exhibit this this slope and explain why the models are you know disagreeing but still giving you a physically meaningful answer, they could serve as pieces of evidence in resolving this scientific controversy. So here the explanation was and so for the model differences, I think part of the explanation is over here is differences in convective parameterizations. Um, there were differences in coarseness. Mm -hmm. um, but in any case, that they, they was basically used to say, to say, look, the real anomalous thing here is not the the model spread. The real anomalous thing here is the satellite data showing little to no warming in the lower troposphere or even cooling in some cases. Okay. And the last example is something related to this idea of diagnosing or explaining uh, errors in climate models. Something I'm really interested in. So I think this is a really general claim, but I think it's important to just say it explicitly. Fixing model errors can showcase scientists' understanding, or maybe you all, your understanding of, of, of your models. So the very practice of identifying what's going wrong and fixing it and seeing that we get a better result. Uh, this, this shows that there's a level of understanding of these complex models that is often not appreciated. Is there a sort of corollary that's slightly terrifying of fixing model errors requires scientists' understanding of their model? <laughs> <laughs> that's a good question. I mean, you could be a brute force empiricist and just, you know, as long as you're getting a better fit with data, maybe you don't. I'm not sure if there's a corollary. 
It might be. I mean, one sort of, so the critique that this is inspired from could be construed as like a corollary, perhaps. It has to do with this philosophical idea of holism. So this goes back a couple hundred years, but the recent version of it was specifically applied to climate models when I came up with it in 2010. The idea that climate models are holistic entities. We can't evaluate their failures or successes piecemeal. And so I'm talking about model errors here, so I'm just going to focus on one part of this. The successes, I think, opens up a lot of extra challenges. Um, but so when we're thinking about a model giving you results that are at odds with observations or are at odds with what you would expect, according to this skepticism, you can't go back and say, well, it's due to the new aerosols that we added to the model. We can't, the, the, the skepticism is saying you can't really do that. All you can say is the model as a whole is giving you a new result and you knew that, and maybe you could say that that change in conjunction with everything else going on in the model resulted in that inaccuracy. But you can't really explain by pointing to specific submodels or specific pieces. And if that seems absurd to you, that's okay. <laughs> but I do want to just make a point, so this isn't to play the blame game, but there has been some scientific acknowledgement of a version of this holistic challenge. And so what I mean here is that there's been uncritical citation of that sort of philosophical claim when it comes to things like knowing when the better performance of a model is, in, is due to improved process representation versus compensating biases if multiple changes were made to a model at the same time. Problems due to tuning, um, whether a model is performing better because it was tuned or not, um, or it has a problem because it was tuned. And then in, in terms of, and also in the context of uh, limitations and how the extent to which we can evaluate models based on what, the observational data that we have. In all of these contexts, there's been some uncritical citation of that holism challenge. But I think it's sort of fair to, to see that because I think that there's sort of a, an implicit tame version of it that everybody sort of signs on to. And, and the tame version is this. It says that climate models are holistic entities and it's difficult to evaluate model failures in a piecemeal fashion. I think that's what people are normally thinking when they say, oh yeah, model holism, let's cite that here because that seems to be really relevant to the, the problems we're facing. But if you go back and look at the text, uh, the claim is that we cannot evaluate model failures in a piecemeal fashion. So it's actually much more radical. Okay, so just a little bit of shameless self-promotion here. I have a recent paper where I talk about the process of error diagnosis. Um, and, and so I try, I address these questions. Why is it difficult specifically in the multi-model context, which I think presents new challenges um, compared to when you're just looking at a single model. And I identify some strategies that have been used to diagnose model errors, and I make some suggestions for how this could be improved. I have a paper doing that. And so the next example that I'm going to talk about comes from, from this paper. Well, it comes from a paper by a bunch of scientists, but I talk about it in this. <laughs> okay, and so when we're thinking back to the initial picture, you know, bad models have value. Here the value is understanding or explaining why they're bad in a particular context can underpin scientific understanding. So this is an example back from the 90s, 1995, from Beckler and a bunch of co-authors. And so this was back in the, the AMIP, the first iteration of AMIP. And what you see here, each line is a different model. And it's a simulation of implied ocean heat transport along the meridian. So you have the latitudes here, and then you have the direct, basically the direction of heat transport here. So positive would be northward and negative would be southward. And so the there's there was an anomaly here that the models in the southern hemisphere were showing, well, you would expect them to be showing southward heat transport in the southern hemisphere. And and in fact, the models are all over the place there. Most of them don't show that. And so this is a case of model error. What, what is the source of the models giving this, this result that is at odds with expectations? 
And then if, if you, I looked in the paper to see how they diagnosed this error. So they already had a hunch, which maybe wouldn't be surprising to you all, that representations of clouds and insufficient uh, simulation of cloud feedbacks um, was uh, suspected to be a culprit right, right at the outset. Um, furthermore, they found a correlation between cloud, uh, cloud radiative forcing and um, the values of, of heat transport. And then they decided to substitute out the model simulations of cloud radiative effects with, the, with an observation derived version, combine that with the other model data to produce like a, like a hybrid. And then, and then they got this. Hmm. All right, so now we see that the, the direction, the southern hemisphere, the ocean's going south in the southern, or the ocean heat is going southward in the southern hemisphere along the meridian. So it resolves the, the anomaly. And what I think this case shows is very clearly the scientists in the study were able to point to specific parts of the model or particular representations, the way clouds were being insufficiently represented, and using that to correct for the anomalous results. And so I think that this shows that there's a level of understanding that does involve pointing to pieces of the model, not just the models as a whole, that is, is at odds with the picture given with the, the models are holistic entities sort of claim. Okay. So that's about the end of the talk. I guess some conclusions and, and implications. So I've, primarily the talk was some examples. So I'm still thinking about what, what the further implications of this would be. But at the very least, I think my initial claim I presented some evidence for that bad models are scientifically valuable. I like to imagine the historical constraints example, example, that one, without the bad models, you wouldn't have the strong correlations, you wouldn't have the constraint, or if you'd have a different constraint, that's not as good. Um, <laughs> and so clearly bad models are doing some work in a variety of different ways. It's just an example. And I think this might also be relevant. I'm sort of new to this debate, but I understand some people are pushing for like a super climate model at maximum, very, very high resolution. And that could take away from resources that would otherwise be used to pursue multiple models at different institutions and resources related to semen. And so the fact that bad models have value, the fact that different, maybe there's more risk taking that's allowed because we have different modeling groups working somewhat, not independently, but you know, separately from each other. That might be severely damaged or limited if, if resources were pulled differently. And so I think that's something that needs to be uh, seriously considered. And then there's lingering sort of philosophical questions, which maybe are also scientific. What's the threshold below which a bad model is not useful? So the what I call the yellow box models ones up there. Uh, it doesn't seem to be useful. Maybe it's useful in terms of understanding what went wrong. Well, there seem to be some cases where we don't want to say that all bad models are always useful or something like that. That seems silly. So where do we draw the line? And uh, and maybe that will tell us more about these two things if we can figure out how to draw the line. And so thank you for your time and attention. And I look forward to any any questions, feedback, critical or otherwise. Thank you so much. That was really, really interesting. Um, I think we'll open it up to questions. If you have a question online, you can either put it in the chat or you can unmute yourself. We'll be able to hear you. Um, otherwise, questions in the room. I think, Marcus, I might have cut you off while you were reading. No, 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 that's fine. Um, yeah, I'm, I, I'm interested in sort of uh, like how some sort of um, understanding of a model's deficiencies or uncertainties internal to that model fits into this framework. So like, you know, things like the, the PPE that uh, Greg and I have done to sort of estimate par parametric uncertainty in the model, mm -hmm. or to try to estimate, um, you know, optimal parameters, I guess, is, the, is one of the end goals. How that can then fit into it. So uh, is it, you know, you could ask similar questions, an ensemble of, of parameter combinations for a model somehow useful in some way or somehow um, illustrative of, of um, trade-offs and, and whatnot. I don't know. 
Well, it seems like it'll be a less trade trade offs. Um, well, yeah, I mean, your 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 claim is not that any of your metrical parameter sets that we go forward with is the optimal parameter set, right? Yeah, they're just equally like you know, given the the cost function that you put in, they're equally as good. But I, I guess when you have like the cloud of models, right, and you, you can imagine sort of an ellipse that defines like what the cloud of that individual model's uncertainty would look like, right? Would that be sort of aligned along the same axis as the sort of multi-model spread? Why, why not, you know? I, don't... Oh, I think that that would be an interesting test. So for instance, in, with the, um, with, with the TCR example, right, you have different TCRs with, with the different, uh, calibrated ensemble, right? And you would then, given the same forcings, expect the same result. I mean, I, 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 would, I wouldn't expect, you know, if you put in our models as individual dots there, that it would look, that it would change that picture at all. I was wondering about your third, um, early on, it was your third quote or third uh, statement. It was out of your paper yeah. about, um, you know, a perfect model is also bad because it, it's as complicated as, as the real yeah. world, which I, I ripped off from Blaze. So, I, which I was curious about. So the very first thing that comes to my mind when I, where it came to my mind when I read that was um, one of the problems, I, I use observations a lot, and uh, one of the problems with, with observations, and I say in quotes because depending on what you're looking at, it can be very error ridden. And, uh, um, and so when we're trying to come up with like scatter plots or, or, or relationships between certain observations, and we're saying, oh, there's no relationship or there's a weak correlation, a lot of times it's because the, the observations are biased, mm -hmm. you know, um, or there's a lot, of, a lot of noise. Bias is even worse than noise, of course. Um, and so we often, in, in some circles that I hang around in, we often say, well, if we just had a perfect model, we could really see if this atmospheric thing relates to this atmospheric cloud. <laughs> We can't test it with the observations because the observations are too noisy. Mm -hmm. So, <clears throat> in that context, a perfect model would be really useful. <laughs> <laughs> so, there, there, a perfect would be like bias free, noise free? Yes, yes. Okay. Because I think of it from the perspective of the problem with observations is that they're not observationally enough, you know, observationish enough. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> they're also models. So, uh, but, in practice. So, sorry, so that's, I mean, that's that's a big issue in philosophy of science, the notion that even observations are theory laden, right? Yeah. So you, there's a, there's a we, we have a, I mean, it has been raised as an issue that if the same theory that is telling you how to interpret your observations is the same theory that you're testing with the models, then there's a, there's a danger of circularity, right? But I'm, I'm pretty much convinced that that is never a real issue because the theories that go into assessing what the observations are, you know, they're related, you know, radio transfer and... Uh, well, precip would be a great... Yeah. Think of how models would almost lead the way for increasing mid-latitude precipitation compared to what the observations were saying for, for what, about a decade or two, because they were too low. Right. We weren't observing enough precip. In that case, we, a perfect model would be really useful to say, oh, look, your observation is wrong, and then we can use that in different, you know, well, I mean, if we had a perfect model, we wouldn't need any observations at all, right? So, so <laughs> except not... except if that model doesn't produce something that we really need to know that would change, maybe we have no observation of that, right? So, in other words, the outputs that we do have, if those are perfect, and we can, and we, and yeah, who cares if they're observable? But there are some outputs that are not observable, so we would need to still know that from the perfect model, right? Well, I mean, so for non-observables, right, you require a model to. Uh, basically infer from the observations what that non-observable is, right? So whether that's TCR, ECS, or some other, or, or some future prediction, right? right? None of which is accessible from uh, from direct observation, right? So you, you're, we're always using a model uh, to to infer what what the best estimate of those parameters uh, would be. Um, uh, But I, I think I think we have to take it as granted, as, as a, take it for granted that uh, that we will never have a perfect model. So. No, we won't. <laughs> I'm just saying it would be useful for some things. <laughs> In that case, maybe there's there's a distinction between like a perfect model and like one so that is bias free and noise free mm -hmm. versus a complete model, one that has you know. every single aspect of the target system that you want. Mm -hmm. If your if your target system is just 
precipitation over some area, then I guess maybe you could have a complete model of that. Maybe completeness is, is just a relative term and that's maybe a little bit messy the way, the way that I posed it in the slide. But I think there is a difference between like a perfect model versus a complete mm -hmm. model. So your quote was more so referring to a complete model. Yeah. That's as complicated as the Earth system. Because the wording was like, if it's realistic in literally every single way, mm -hmm. as, as realistic as the world in all respects. Yeah. Whereas this would be like, it's matching the world exactly right in just the couple of respects that we're interested in, just precipitation values over X land area or whatever. But yeah, I think that type of perfect model that you mentioned would <laughs> be very useful. I agree. It doesn't look like we have any questions online. Can I ask a question of you all? Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. So I'm new to this. I know there's a little bit of a debate. The second, the gray box, the multi-model ensembles, maybe not versus, but you know, resources pooled into one versus the other. Mm -hmm. Is that, do you, do you think that what I, some of what I said here is relevant to that? And also is that, is this push for one kilometer kind of models, is that being seriously pursued? And how, what do you all think of that? Just kind it of is a lot of core hours going to that. I mean, I think like there, there needs to still be a lot of stuff put into just understanding the, the uncertainties in our model, kind of getting a grip on what we know and what we don't know or what components of our models might be bad or contributing to structural errors overall. Mm -hmm. And so for that, you need to, yeah, run like big ensembles of your model, which costs about as much as running a high resolution model. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But I mean, there aren't any one kilometer kind of models. I mean, it's, it's, you know, so it's, it's, um, it's a theoretical question. But it's a goal for some people. Well, I, mean, I, I mean, sure, it's a goal for everybody. The issue is, is you know how do you allocate resources right now between all the different goals, right? So if we allocated all resources to a one kilometer climate model, then in maybe ten years we're gonna have one one kilometer climate. Uh, but it would have a climate sensitivity that you do not know is correct. You couldn't do something like the TCR. You yeah, wouldn't be able to do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. And so if you look at what caused the spread in the TCR, what caused the spread in the TCR. It's not things that are removed by having better uh, spatial resolution, right? It, it, it actually turns out to be things in the cloud microphysics, right? Things that are uh, still you know, another, you know, <laughs> three, nine, another nine orders of magnitude smaller than the one kilometer grid box, right? So, you know, do we have to wait until we can have, like, not just five orders of magnitude, but like another 14 orders of magnitude improvement in, in models before we can say anything? Or is that the only thing we should be doing? No. It's ridiculous. I mean, we we actually take away macrophysical physics and parameters. Actually, when we go to one kilometer model and add more microphysics, like in convection, for instance, like these thunderstorms and stuff, mm -hmm. and make it. I don't. There's no guarantee it would be even more. So the uncertainty, right? and, you have, and you have no idea. I mean, there's no there's no expectation that you'd be close to convergence. Right. 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 That all kilometer scale models yeah. would give you the same answer. Yeah. Right. I mean, we, we, so I mean, so one one of the things to to compare this with is 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 uh, a situation where we have a very good understanding of, of the theoretical structure, right? So we don't have a perfect theory of climate, right? So, so all models are their own theory of climate, but we do have a very good theory of radiative transfer, right? So if you look at the different models for line by line uh, radiative transfer, they all give you the same answer effectively, right? And so there, there, isn't, there isn't any uncertainty there. So uh, the value of a bad model in a system that is extremely well characterized is obviously going to be much less than the value of a bad model in a system where there is no underlying uh, general theory, right? So they would be bad in the sense that they would just be wrong, right? Whereas the other ones would be very useful. That speaks to the third conclusion, the threshold below which a bad model. Right, which I don't know that we that we that we discuss very much. I mean, do we have any do we have any thoughts on that? I mean, in CMIP5, there were two models that often just flipped. Right? There was the Russian model, and there was one of maybe the French or one of the Chinese models. Um, and they would just get regularly tossed. People would just not look at them. Right? And so, so I think that in practical terms, there is a, 
there is a threshold. But then there are also, you know, oddities in how individual models did things uh, that meant that they were inadequate for some particular purpose, mm -hmm. right? So in CMIP 5, uh, there was one model that was modeling uh, volcanic eruptions as a decrease in solar um, irradiance, right? Whereas in the real world, volcanic eruptions affect the the uh, reflectivity of the planets, and so they have less shortwave coming into the system, but it's not because of the sun, right? Um, and it turns out that the uh, if you model it as a decrease in the sun, then in the stratosphere it would cool, but in the real world it would, uh, if you model it as an increase in aerosols, it would warm, right? So you get opposite uh, responses in, in, in the stratosphere, right? And so when you plotted, you know, the stratospheric temperature of all the different models and you had a big volcano, um, you know, nine out of ten of them went up, as you expected, and is what you see in the observations, and the other one went down, <laughs> right? So so that is, that would be, if I was interested in stratospheric temperatures and stratospheric temperature trends, uh, that would be a model that would be so bad I would not even look at it, right? Because it's, 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 it's phenomenologically wrong, right? Now, in the Santa uh, 2005 example, right, so the, the models that had no ENSO were the GIST models. So the ones right at the very end uh, with, with, the, with the GIST models. And the interesting thing is that the uh, skill in the long-term mean, right, uh, the GIST models were right, were right where they should be, right? So, so the GIST model skill in the, in, the, in, the, in the decadal trend was very close to what was observed, but the, uh, but the standard deviation, the, the ENSO thing, was not. So the, the conclusion there is that uh, skill in decadal trend estimates is not actually related to skill in ENSO uh, amplitude. Right? And there's a lot of skill metrics where people found exactly that. They thought, okay, well, this is an important thing. Let's, let's rank our models on the basis of this, of this performance, you know, this metric. Um, but then they would either uh, end up with, um, uh, with poorer estimates of, of what was going to go on, or it would make no difference at all right, if, you, if you weighted the models. And that would happen when your metric actually had no correlation to the, to the prediction. Right, and so, it, and then you're just so. And then, if you waited on that metric, effectively, you're just taking a random sample for something that doesn't make any difference, and so you'd end up with exactly the same trend. So there were there were, I would say, hundreds of CMIP five papers that went through really complicated model weighting procedures, only to end up with something that looked exactly like the un, the unweighted model mean, <laughs> which was frustrating for them, but kind of interesting. <laughs> But I don't. Th I don't think that's going to be true with CMIP six, right? I think. I think that now it's very clear that uh, that the trends are uh, affected by the ECS, and the ECS is outside of the bounds for for these hot models. And so, so now all of the arguments that I made, uh, you know, uh, quite vocally during the CMIP five period, that you know, a lot of these things didn't matter, uh, they're, it's tossed, like, it's like, yeah, that was, that was then. <laughs> so I might cut, well, we are too, we can definitely keep chatting, um, but maybe, yeah, if people want to, like, actually go about the day, maybe we can give another round of applause to Ryan. And maybe cut it off there. Ryan is going to be around for the rest of the afternoon and is joining us for happy hour today. Mm -hmm. So if you want to kind of keep having discussions, we can hang out in here. I don't know if there's another meeting after this. Don't think so. Or you can come down and find Ryan in my office in 608. Um, yeah. My wife will also be happy. Yes. She's another philosopher of science, but she's a lot smarter than I am. <laughs> <laughs> And defending her. And defending her dissertation tomorrow. tomorrow so. <laughs> She's probably really primed with all the knowledge. <laughs> okay. So is there some sense for like, sorry, everyone's in your home. Um, how much yeah, of like yeah. these things are owing to kind of similar parameterization or structural differences or similar?